All right, so tonight we're going to talk about Ezra, image resolution rather, and why your file sizes matter for your photography. Uh, so funnily enough, I was walking through the mall and I saw this poster, and just Baskin Robbins, and immediately, like, ice cream or sweets, my attention is drawn. Uh, but I was looking at this poster and realizing this is a great example of why image resolution matters for your files when you send them to clients or when you print them for yourself. So I was standing pretty far away from this sign, probably like 15 or 20 feet when I took this photo, so everything looks fine and that's great. Uh, unfortunately, when you zoom into the sign, zoom in, meaning walk forward closer to the sign, Curtis, uh, you can see it starts to pixelate here, and these start to look like Lego blocks, and it happens to the type, it happens to the image above, the sprinkles, the cone, the wrapper, even the branding and the different differentiation between the background and the actual cone. Uh, and just to show that I haven't screwed with this image too much, like here's my big fat finger pointing, being like, hey, this is my real life finger in front of the sign that is very pixelated for people to see. Uh, so apparently they didn't know the size this was going to be, so when they expanded and like stretched this file out, what they did is they decreased the quality of the file and it didn't have as many pixels or data to compensate for that. There's no kind of enhance filter like there is in CSI, for example. Uh, so when we're talking about image resolution, the big things are pixels and megabytes. Uh, pixels are what make up your photograph. So all these little squares, if you zoom in really quick to like a small graphic uh, or even a photo, you'll see once you get down to the very kind of like pixel level, they're all boxes. There's no smooth lines here. The way we make smooth lines is by gradation and also kind of playing with that Minesweeper-esque layout that we have to work with when we're working with digital media. Uh, the one place that isn't the case in graphic design, we're using vectors, but that's a whole nother conversation. With photography, we're always dealing with pixels. You capture a box of color onto your camera sensor, and then you decide what color it's going to be, how bright or dark it's going to be, and that's what makes our lines, our definition, and also our sharpness. Uh, so in Photoshop, for example, you can make a canvas any size you like. It can be, you know, 3,456 pixels wide by 2,304 pixels tall. Uh, the result of how big that canvas is going to be how many megabytes your file is. Obviously there's a little bit of flexibility that changes there with the megabytes because if it's just going to be a scene of all white versus like a city scene with a whole bunch of colors and different things to remember, it will change the size of the file but they'll be within kind of a percentage of each other depending on how big the actual canvas or the file is going to be. Okay. Uh, so bringing this back to reality here, why are pixels important here? Every social media or website you upload things to has a specified file size they'd like, or else they're gonna compress it based on their algorithm. That doesn't always work out so well for people. Uh, so Instagram, for example, which is all really popular, um, probably the most used image-based sharing website we know of right now, uh, their standards right now are 1,080 pixels. So if you upload anything bigger than that, what Instagram is actually going to do to keep their platform running smoothly and photos running, uh, sorry, loading at a acceptable speed for internet users that are ripping through things, is they're going to bring it down to 1,080 pixels. So if files really big, what you're saying to Instagram is, hey, I want you to compress or make this file smaller, but you're going to do it, and I don't have much control over that, and that's obviously not great. So the closer we get to the numbers that the platform, whichever we're using to upload things onto is, the less they're going to muck with our images, which is a good thing. On the other side, too, we want to make sure our files are at least that big. If you upload a photo that's maybe 500 pixels wide and it's supposed to be 1,000 pixels, they're just going to stretch it, and you're going to look really, really bad. And I've got some examples of that coming up right now. Uh, so... If you don't have Photoshop or Lightroom, don't worry, there's tons of places on the internet you can resize your images. I use bulk resize for a lot of my students. It's the most simple and straightforward and easiest to remember, frankly, as a domain name. Kudos to the people who bought this out. Uh, but when you're going to resize images, you can just go here, click upload your images. It could be one, it could be a hundred, whatever you like. Uh, you can just go to longest side. I always choose longest side because if you're shooting a landscape or portrait orientation, your width and heights aren't always going to be the same, so I just say longest edge and I want that to be 2,000 pixels. And then you know you're going to be a consistent size of photo through the whole batch you get them to upload, so you don't have to do your uh, landscape photos in one batch and then your portrait photos in another batch. Okay. Once you kind of click start, it resizes them all, makes them appropriate for whatever media you need to upload them to, whether that be a Facebook gallery, whether that be a client site, things like that, if you don't have things like Photoshop or Instagram. Uh, so what actually happens to an image if you rank around with it too much? Uh, everybody thinks they can kind of just like, we'll fix it in Photoshop is the f like inside joke on set. The photographers, assistants, digital techs, anybody working in the industry is just very worried about every time when a client or agency says that, we'll just fix it in Photoshop. Yes, there's some things you can do in Photoshop, but not everything is fixable. So if we take this example from that self-portrait assignment, I've resized this down to 2,000 pixels wide on the long edge, so across the top there, 
horizontally. And it worked out to be about 2,000 kilobytes, or one, uh, two megabytes, rather. So a small file, reasonable, easy to send over email, pretty straightforward. Could you use it as a background for your desktop or laptop, something like that? Obviously, you want my shining face there. Uh, so this file looks fine right now. You can see all the detail on the shelves. If you zoomed in, you could probably read the spines of the books up there. Uh, it's a whole bunch of stuff that just looks nice on a shelf. I haven't read them all, working on it. Hashtag COVID things. Uh, so I took that exact same photo and I sized it all the way down and had 2,000 pixels to 20 pixels. So now the file is 7 kilobytes, so it's going to load super, super fast, but obviously we can't see me. I'm super tiny, so we're just going to pull and stretch this file out. Like, what would happen if you didn't have a bigger file to begin with? You, this is what you were given. You said, okay, cool, we now need to make this 2,000 pixels wide. We pull that, and this is what happens. We see a sense of what's in that original photo, so that orange basket behind me, the orange pillow to my right-hand side, left-hand side in the photo, it's there, but what the computer had to do is guess and kind of say, hey, I had a black or dark pixel here, there's probably going to be, you know, they expanded it 20 times, so we're just going to put 20 times more black pixels, which is why you get this kind of blocky effect. While yes, it's very cool and abstract and whatever, it doesn't make for the best photo for the client, especially if you uploaded the wrong size, and this happens on the platform. Uh, Less extreme of example here, so instead of sizing it down to 20 pixels, I sized it down to 200 pixels, and it's, you know, 55 kilobytes, still very quick loading time, easy to kind of pop up on your computer or email. And then I'm just going to pull that out again to the original size, and you can see we're starting to get that Lego piece effect. We can see a lot more detail now in terms of, like, there's an arm, there's a human in this photo, they're holding something, they've got headphones on, behind them is a lamp. Like, we can define all those details. But it does look not blurry from that 200, but can increase it like 10 or 20 times. It just doesn't have the data, and we don't have the technology to kind of look at a file and say, hey, we'll extrapolate this, and it's the size of a postage stamp, and now we're going to wrap an entire apartment building in this photo. That's just not the way image quality and files work. So going back to the kind of original example, this is what it should look like at the correct sizing for this example. So stretched out from 200 pixels, actual resolution for 2,000 pixels. So much happier results here. So when you're thinking of uploading files and you want to know what the client needs it for, image sizing is really important. Usually when I send files to clients, I have a email-friendly folder and a print-friendly folder because I don't know who's going to open the delivery. It might be the client who's a graphic designer and they're really well-versed in what this all means and pixels and PPI, which is something we'll get to in another episode. Uh, but email friendly, they're not going to blow up someone's inbox with like a 10 megabyte JPEG of someone's face when it only needs to be this big. So you kind of talk people through how the photo is going to be used, what it's going to be used for, who needs to send it, where is it going, what's the purpose of it, how is it going to help people. And making those versions also very quick. You can do it in Lightroom in two clicks to kind of add another set of deliveries. You've got your email friendly, which is more kind of like 2,000 pixels wide. And then you've got your client delivery, which is kind of the original JPEG output, which is massive. And they can use to print perhaps in like a book or a brochure or maybe on an advertisement. So they don't end up with that blocky thing we saw in the Baskin Robbins ad. Uh, when in doubt, you can always go smaller. Every camera is going to have a different quality setting that you can change to from like small, medium, large, raw files. You can always shoot big and then downsize. That's the easy way to go. Going the other way is much harder because, again, we're stretching that information. It's going to say rather than my gray shirt has like a black button here, it's going to be this is a black box, and we're going to add like 20 black pixels around that if we need to expand that, and that's where we're going to lose that quality. Uh, so quick little session today, but the homework I'd like to do is figure out the image output for your device. Uh, with cameras, this is going to be a little more varied because everybody has different pixel dimensions for their sensors. For, you know, iPhones or Android phones, whatever you're using smartphone-wise, you're probably going to just have one single output, not a control over how big that is, until you actually get into the crop side of things, and then you're just going to be downsizing, so you don't have to worry about where you're beginning and how big that pixel resolution is. So for example, this is one of my cameras. I have a Canon 60 Mark II, and when I looked up on the internet, these are all the settings I have to figure out what makes a file out of each of those individual quality settings. So at large, I'm making a file that's 6,240 pixels wide by 4,160 pixels tall. And if I size that down all the way, I'm capturing less and less information, but consequently, the file is going to be much smaller. So you kind of have to balance out, like, how much quality do I need for the shoot? For me, it's always, like, as big a file I can get as possible, like, large JPEG, raw file, because then I can always go smaller. It's one of those things, if you're at the top of, you know, a big snowy mountain trail in the winter, and you've brought your camera gear all the way up there, 
for me, it's worth capturing as much quality as possible because I don't know when I'm going to be back there again. And also the costs involved, whether they be assistance, lighting crew, rental, talents, even just the airtime up on the mountain, the permits and things like that. It's just easier to capture the most quality on the file as possible. Uh, also in my camera manual, I had a little diagram like this, which you will probably have, which looks super overwhelming to begin with, but it kind of gives you a sense of how big the file is going to be and also how large you can print it, how large the actual file size. Because when we look at purchasing SD or memory cards for our cameras, we say, hey, we're going on a trip, we shoot 200 photos a day, they're all going to be this big, how many shots can I fit onto a card, how many cards do I need to buy? You can start to do that math thinking about, well, you know, if I need to eke out a little more room, I can go to a smaller, smaller file size and pick that size so I can fit more images on the card. An example for this would be at large JPEG, you can do a thousand possible shots, whereas if you go to medium JPEGs, it's about 1900 shots. So you're almost doubling the amount of files you can fit on a card by changing the image quality that you're capturing for your camera. Again, always important to understand, are these just practice photos or these for fun? Am I shooting these to learn so I can cram a whole bunch on? I don't have to worry about changing out cards ever. Or is this really important? Am I going to see the Northern Lights for this once in a lifetime trip and I wanna get the best file possible out of everything? I can't answer that for you. You know your trips and your shoots better than I do, but this is something to keep in mind where we have a little bit of flexibility in terms of how much we can capture on our card, but the consequences afterwards, if we wanna make, say we thought we were just gonna do four by sixes for family, and four by sixes are about yay big, the size of someone's face, and you said, oh, all of a sudden somebody saw it and like, well, we wanna put that on a calendar or a billboard or something huge, and like, well, my file is only this big. There's only so much you can do to make that file bigger. Maybe you can make it double the size, but you certainly can't quadruple or like 10x that file. So always good to kind of err on the side of capturing bigger than you need, because then you've got that safety in the future. That's everything tonight. I hope you had an interesting time learning about image resolution and figuring out what's right for your camera. Uh, always make sure when you pick up your camera, it's set to the right one, because sometimes I know photographers go back and forth, so it's always worth being a part of your early checklist when you pick up your camera and say, hey, I'm gonna check the ISO, I'm gonna check my image quality recording settings, all those things to make sure you're not recording in the setting for practice that you are for an actual client shoot or something you're really, really excited about getting a big, big print out of.